All right, we talked last time about the different pressures acting on the lung. Intrapulmonary pressure, where is that pressure? Inside the, specifically, no, intrapulmonary pressure is pressure inside the, <laughs> alveoli. The pressure inside the alveoli. And what will increase the pressure in the alveoli? More specifically? The more air inside the alveoli, the greater the pressure. Would you agree with that? So we would see the highest pressure in the alveoli, the greatest intrapulmonary pressure during what phase of breathing? At the end of inhalation or inspiration, right? At the end of inspiration, we would see the highest pressure, right? Because there's maximum volume of air. And then we blow that air out. So when would we see the, when would we see the lowest intrapulmonary pressure? Yeah, at the end of exhalation or expiration. Okay, so that's intrapulmonary pressure, just kind of refreshing our memory from last time. And then we talked about intrapleural pressure. Where is this pressure in the pleural cavity. And where is the pleural cavity? Yeah, it's between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. It's that those membranes, one lines the body cavity, one lines the lung, and there's a little bit of fluid between those two membranes, and that's what we call the pleural cavity, that space between those membranes. So that pressure is, always has what value to it? It has a negative value. It can be either negative four as far as negative six, depending on the breathing cycle. We'll talk about that today, but it's always negative. And why is it always negative? Why is the pleural pressure always negative? Well, let's think about um, what prevents the pleural fluid from building up and putting pressure on the lung. Is there anything that, because we're always creating a little bit of pleural fluid, what's keeping it in check so the volume doesn't get too high in there? There's a vessel that drains the excess pleural fluid. Yeah, lymphatics. We have lymphatic vessels that drain the pleural fluid. So when you're constantly draining fluid out of a space, what is that going to do to the pressure in there? It's going to keep it lower. And then also, every time we inhale, the body wall pulls outward, that parietal pleura pulls outward, and the lungs are elastic. They want to stay, you know, their normal size. So they're pulled on by the parietal pleura. What happens to a space when I increase the volume? Pressure goes down. So every time we inhale, pressure goes down. So we're always stretching the space because the body cavity, the parietal pleura wants to go out. The visceral pleura and the elastic tissue of the lung pulls it inward, so we're always stretching that space without adding any fluid to it, so that's going to drop pressure also. So there's constant pull of the body wall, that makes it negative, and the lymphatics draining that space make it negative. So those are the two pressures we talked about last time, pleural pressure and intrapulmonary pressure. And then we talked about the pressure outside the body, which we call atmospheric pressure, um, some of your animations might call it barometric pressure. It's the same thing. It's just pressure outside the body. And normally it's equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so the negative intrapleural pressure, again, is due to the recoil of the lungs. The elastic recoil just means that if I stretch the lungs out during inhalation, they want to go back to their normal resting position. They're elastic. The connective tissue of the lungs is elastic, so it acts inward on the lungs. It wants them to collapse inward. And then the surface tension, the alveoli, are lined with a layer of water because as we inhale the air, we have mucus that lines our airways. And that mucus is mostly water. So when the air passes through this really humid environment, it picks up moisture. So when we get down into the alveoli, this air is very moist. There's a lot of water vapor in it, and that water settles on the, on the walls of the alveoli. And water wants to cling to itself. It wants to form a drop, right? If I stick my finger in a cup of water and I pull it out, I'm going to have a little drop because water sticks to itself. So we call that surface tension. 
So if I look at the walls of the alveoli, if they're lined with this water, they want to stick to each other and collapse those alveoli. So that's another inward force on the lung. So it's important that maybe make a chart up to this point, and we'll be adding to it today. Make a, make a nice little table. So insert table. Just make a nice forces that act out on the lung. Keep it inflated. And forces that act inward on the lung help it to deflate. Because don't we want both types of forces? Because the force on the left side is going to allow us to inhale, and the forces on the right side are going to allow us to exhale. We can't have one more than the other because we need both of these actions of the lung. So we talked about surface tension. Which column, left or right, would surface tension follow? That water layer on the inside of the alveoli causing surface tension. Which way would that act on the lung? What? Surface tension does what? The water layer on the inside of the alveoli, we have those water molecules, they want to stick to each other. So the water molecule on one side of the alveoli is attracted to the water molecule on the other wall of the alveoli, on the other side. So that wants to form a drop and do what? What? It wants to collapse the alveoli. Water wants to stick to itself. So we have this nice air in the center of the alveolus, and that water layer wants to collapse it. Maybe we need to make this more visual, because some people are struggling with this. Let's see. Um, surface tension in alveoli. OK. So. We see the water molecules here want to attract each other. Okay? So if they attract one another, they're going to pull inward on the alveolar wall. Does that make sense? Let's see if I can find another picture. Yeah. Okay, let's say these are water molecules here. The more water molecules, or the, the larger the alveoli, the less attraction there's going to be. Would you agree with that? The larger the alveoli, the less likely this water molecule will be forming hydrogen bonds with this water molecule and collapsing the alveoli. Would you agree with that? So if I have a smaller alveoli, the water molecules are more likely to attract one another. Would you agree with that? So would you, would you agree that deep breathing, which expands our alveoli, would be better to fight the effects of surface tension and keep our lungs inflated? Definitely. So if we go back to our chart then, surface tension belongs on this side. Surface tension in alveoli due to water layer. That acts inward on the lung. So that's helpful when we want to exhale. When we want to exhale, that's a force that helps bring the alveoli back down. Okay, so we also have elastic recoil of the lungs. So when I stretch the lungs out, the connective tissue that they're made of wants to bring them back to their resting position. So we go back to our table. Elasticity belongs on this side as well. Elastic recoil due to connective t I can't type tissue in lung. All right, so elastic recoil is another one. Now the lungs, the, or the, the rib cage itself, is elastic. That the ribs want to stay out. So when I exhale, aren't I pressing down on the rib cage when I exhale? And then the lungs want to kind of go back out again to their resting position. So we do have some elasticity of the chest wall. 
the ribs themselves that are attached to muscles, which have the parietal pleura attaching, which then attach to the lungs via the visceral pleura, that wants to pull the lungs outward. So just the, the, the rib cage itself. So elasticity of the chest wall. That's going to pull our ribs outward. So if I have a rigid, stiff rib cage, like a person who is elderly, the cartilage stiffens with age. They're less able to move their chest cavity and cough. Would you agree with that? If I needed to really clear my lungs and cough hard, wouldn't it be hard to depress the chest cavity and bring those ribs inward to get a nice forceful exhale? If I've got stiff ribs, and that's a problem. That's why the elderly, when they catch a respiratory infection, the typical common cold, that can turn into pneumonia for them because they can't clear their airways very well. And that's why we get concerned about influenza and we try to protect the elderly and people with you know, weak uh, respiratory muscles. We want to protect them from getting influenza because they're going to have more complications because they can't clear their airways as effectively. Okay, so um, this negative intrapleural pressure is caused by these fighting forces. We have the forces acting inward on the lung that want to bring it inward, and then you have the outward force of the chest wall wanting to pull those lungs outward, so they're battling. It's like a tug of war, and it's stretching that pleural space a little bit without increasing any molecules in there. So whenever we increase volume without adding stuff to it, pressure goes down. So we always need a negative pressure, and if we don't have a negative pressure, the stickiness between these two membranes disappears, and the lungs collapse. So we never want to see pleural pressure equal to alveolar pressure or, or pulmonary pressure, and we never want to see it equal to pressure outside the body. So what are some things that can penetrate this, these membranes that would cause the lungs to collapse if we don't take care of it and plan for it ahead of time? Do we ever penetrate the chest cavity? When? Surgery. If I'm doing open heart surgery or I need to do a lung biopsy, I'm going to be going in through the chest wall and disturbing this pleural space. So now I've got issues with lung collapse. What can I do? Do you know what happens? What do we do to patients where we disturb their pleural cavity? Yep, we put a chest tube. And that's just a tube that goes in that pleural space. It has a negative pressure and it is constantly draining excess fluid out of that space until that little area heals. How about in Chicago, at the ER in inner city Chicago where there's a lot of gang violence? Gunshot wounds, stab wounds, even in an accident, car accident, broken ribs can penetrate the parietal pleura and cause lung collapse. And there was a person, a kid, who actually died on the school bus years ago in the 60s. They named a park after him in Milwaukee, and I'm from Milwaukee. It's the only reason I know that. But my dad told me about it. Is, um, it was a football game. He had a fractured rib. It punctured his parietal pleura. His lung collapsed, and he died on the school bus on the way back to the school after an away game. What? Yeah, you would think so, right. But he was probably just trying to tough it out and, yeah, passed away. So um, whenever we see someone who's really struggling to breathe and they've got, you know, some lung infections, we can start to think lung collapse. And another thing that can cause lung collapse is if I have too much fluid in my alveoli, like I showed you in that little picture that I found just on the Internet, um, those... Um, will collapse. If we have too much fluid and not enough air getting into our alveoli, that's going to cause collapse. So people with pneumonia can end up with a collapsed lung. Or someone who has a lot of mucus in their airways, in their bronchioles, if air is trapped in a teeny tiny little alveoli and there's no exchange of air, because we should see constant exchanging of air when we breathe. We're pushing new air down into the alveoli, we're exhaling old air from the upper airway. So there's constant, this constant exchange. But if I have mucus trapping in uh, a part of the lung, those alveoli will absorb that air, and there'll be no air in there, and it'll collapse. So if we have any kind of blocking of the airways, that can cause lung collapse. Yes? Yeah. Uh, 
That's air. Yep. Yep. People get, um, when they enter into that space, they end up getting um, air in the pleural space, and then it leaks out into the chest cavity, and their eyes get huge, and you can actually feel it. If you touch it, it's air under the skin. It's called subcutaneous emphysema. That's the name of that, and it does. People think it's fluid, but it's not. It's actually air. If you touch it, you'll feel it's not squishy and heavy. It's real light, yes. Yes, yep, yep, and whenever you're assessing a chest tube, you want to feel around it for that rice crispy kind of saran wrap under the skin kind of feel, and that's called subcutaneous emphysema. I'm glad you asked that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, so that's where, you know, it was probably in the wrong space, and now it ended up all underneath the skin. Just takes time. The body will reabsorb it over time. It just takes time. It's really uncomfortable, though. Yeah, I had a guy that had huge eye eyelids and eyebrows. They just ballooned out with the subcutaneous emphysema, and I thought it was fluid because I didn't get report that he had this issue. So I'm like, whoa, what is this about? Because I was doing a night shift and didn't see the patient. He was sleeping. I thought, oh my goodness, and I thought it was fluid too, until someone said that subcutaneous emphysema. I was like, oh my gosh, if you touch it then you can feel it, so. From infection, yeah, that's a different thing because when you're doing an intramuscular injection through an animal, you're not um, sterilizing the hair. You're taking bacteria in the hair and you're shoving it down into the muscle. Shave the hair, or if you shave the hair, you know that would be the most. But with humans, when we do a chest tube, you know we're sterilizing that site really well, so we don't see infection too often with chest tubes, and they're not in very long either to set up for infection, so. Um, well, yeah, when you get air, some bacteria produce gases, you know, so it just depends on the type of bacteria, too. Okay, so we look at the pressure across the wall of the alveoli. That's what tr transpulmonary pressure is. It's just what is the pressure in the alveoli, subtract the pressure in the pleural space, and that's called transpulmonary pressure. So using a little bit of math knowledge, this is always a negative value. So we're subtracting a negative number. What happens when you have two negatives together in math? You're adding. So if this is, say, a negative 4, intrapulmonary or intrapleural, sorry, pressure is a negative 4, and this is, say, 0 at the end of inhalation, 0 minus a negative 4, or let's say negative 6 even, let's say it's this negative as far as 6, N minus a negative 6 is a positive 6, right? So the larger this transpulmonary pressure, the larger the lungs. And that would be like at the end of inhalation. Okay, so this is the transpulmonary pressure. So it's the pressure across the wall of the lungs, across the wall of the alveoli. So typically we say intrapleural pressure at rest is negative 4. We give a value, instead of saving, saying 760 inside the alveoli, let's just say zero at rest in between breaths when we're just hanging out, not ready to inhale yet. We just got done exhaling. Again, negative four is the intrapleural, zero is the intrapulmonary inside the alveoli. So if I go zero minus a negative four, my transpulmonary pressure is four. So we talked about atelectasis. That's the fancy name for lung collapse. You need to know that term. That's a very specific term for the respiratory system. You're going to see it on the chart of your patients. And I remember being a CNA on 6 West, the cardiopulmonary unit. Um, I saw that. Atelectasis, what does that mean? I remember reading, you know, hyponatremia. What does that mean? So you, plural effusion, what does that mean? So you look all these words up, and it makes a lot more sense. So atelectasis is lung collapse. So like I said, it can be due to plugged bronchioles. That means you have a patient who has a lot of junk in their airways, and those bronchioles can't exchange air with the alveoli. And what do we say happens to trapped air in the alveoli if it can't 
keep moving and exchanging? Where does it go? The air in the alveoli, if, there is, if it's plugged above it, it gets absorbed. It gets absorbed by the alveolar walls and it just goes away. And then what happens? Collapse. So alveoli that are not constantly exchanging with the airways above will absorb the air in them and collapse. So lots of mucus, inflammation, we're going to see collapse of the lung. Any kind of wound that, you know, surgery, stab, broken ribs, gunshot is going to cause lung collapse. So we have patients that are not doing deep breathing, and if we don't keep our alveoli expanded deep in the bases of our lungs, our, those alveoli in the base of our lungs are going to collapse. So when you have patients that are in a lot of pain, and especially abdominal pain, like abdominal surgery kind of things, they're not going to want to take deep breaths. They're going to take real shallow breaths, and they're not going to be filling those alveoli, and the alveoli are going to absorb the air in them, and they're going to collapse. So you see little tiny collapsed areas of collapsed lung in people that are in a lot of pain. Same thing as if we let them lay in bed all day and give them lots of narcotic medications and hitting their pain pump or just taking lots of oral pills and sleeping all day, their lungs are going to collapse as we let them lie there. So it's really important that we get people up and deep breathing using that incentive spirometer. Because if we don't, their lungs are going to collapse, even just sitting around with shallow breathing. And when you're taking a test like you were today, taking some deep breaths helps fill up your alveoli. Because when you're hunched over your kitchen table for hours on end taking shallow, kind of stressed out breaths, right? When we're kind of stressed, we're <laughs> or when you're driving in the car and you're thinking, oh, I got this exam today and you're not breathing very well, that actually sets off the stress response because your oxygen levels drop, and now you're having panic attacks, and you think, oh my gosh, now I'm really having a, having a mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, is take some deep breaths, hold it, and then let it out slowly through pursed lips. And that's what you have to tell your patients that have bad gas exchange. They can maximize their gas exchange by taking a deep breath through the nose, and then slowly letting that air out. That keeps those alveoli expanded. It allows time for the oxygen to diffuse across those membranes. But patients get upset. They get in pain. They get short of breath, and they're doing <laughs> And now you've got that situation going on, and they're going to just start to tank with their oxygen saturation. So that's where you got to calm them down, tell them to take a deep breath, slowly let it out. And you'll see it. You'll see their oxygen saturation just climb. But they need you and your little bit of knowledge of the respiratory system to keep them on track. And this is just simple stuff. Deep breathing and slowing that exhale. It also stops a panic attack for people that are, you know, oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. Um, just the deep breathing and increasing your oxygenation also releases neurotransmitters of the parasympathetic response and those kind of calming neurotransmitters. So if you feel like you're going down that path of getting overly anxious, having a stress attack, Deep breath, hold it, and let it out slowly. And do that about 10 times, and that helps calm people down. OK, so now we'll just look at um, inhalation, exhalation. This is a review from General A&P. So if you look at the handout I gave you on um, Blackboard, or not Blackboard, I handed out in class the chart. So let me see what page we're on here. So in the handout I gave you, this is on page 542, page 542. So two things have to happen if we want to bring air in. We have to change pressure, right? You have to get pressure to go from, you have to get air to go from high pressure to low pressure. So we need to change the pressure. And to change the pressure, we need to change the volume, because that has to happen first. Because we just can't magically change the pressure inside of our lungs. The only thing we have control over is the volume. And if we change the volume, it changes the pressure. We talked about that last time, right? So if I, how do I change the volume of my chest cavity? Specifically. The diaphragm and what other muscles? So the diaphragm is underneath the lungs. External intercostals lie over the ribs. 
and those involuntarily, with the help of the medulla and the pons, contract to increase the chest cavity. So if I increase the volume, what happens to pressure inside the lungs? It decreases. So now I have a low pressure environment and air flows from high pressure outside the body to low pressure inside the body and I bring my air in. And then it stops when pressures are equal to zero, equal to outside air. And then I turn off those muscles, so I inhibit that action potential to the diaphragm and external intercostals. Diaphragm moves up, ribs move in. What happens to pressure? Increases and air flows out. So this graph is really showing that as volume increases during inhale, what happens to the pressure? Well, pressure is zero beginning at inhale, right? Pressure goes down as air starts to flow. Well, as I increase the, as I increase the um, volume, pressure goes down. And then as air flows in, it starts to go up inside the alveoli. So as my volume increases, my pressure increases as air flows in, right? And then look at intrapleural pressure. It starts at negative four, so when the pressure in the alveoli is zero, my intrapulmonary pressure is zero, then my pleural pressure is always negative. Starting at negative four, it drops to negative six at the peak of inhalation. And then it rises back to negative four again. So the process from start to finish is about five seconds. And it's, of course, we see volume changing first via the help of the diaphragm and external intercostals, causing a pressure change, which causes air to flow. So page 542 in your packet on the top, it says, <clears throat> when the diaphragm contracts and moves downward, what happens to the internal volume of the thorax? You, you <clears throat> I need a drink. What happens to the internal volume of the thorax? <clears throat> Are we going to choose the up or the down arrow? What? Up arrow. Yep, so you just put uh, an X in the up arrow column if you want, or you can just put an up arrow underneath it, whichever. Then go over to internal pressure in the thorax. What happens to the pressure in the thorax during this time that the diaphragm is contracted and moving downward? <clears throat> goes down. So we're going to choose the down arrow column. And then the size of the lungs. The size of the lungs are increasing, so we'll choose the up arrow column. And the direction of airflow into the lung. And then the next one, when the diaphragm is relaxed and moving back upward, we're going to choose the opposite column that we did in the first example, correct? Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So next time we'll talk about factors that affect other forces that affect the lungs, such as compliance. So we'll pick up with this slide next time. <clears throat>